Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Mackenzie Boudreau. I'm an intern here at Jordan Valley Church. And yeah, if I have not met you, I would love the opportunity to. So I'm here to preach the word this morning, and our, uh, our passage is out of Luke chapter 16 as we continue our series in the book of Luke. So Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 15, if you have a Bible, you can turn there, or you can read it off the screen. Luke chapter 16, verse 1 reads, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would illumine our minds and our understanding and our hearts to understand your word, that we'd be drawn nearer to you. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of those who do not know you this morning by your word. Lord, would they come to a true understanding and knowledge of who you are. And Lord, for those of us who are walking with you, I pray that you would draw us nearer to yourself, that we would grow in understanding and love for you as a result of this time. Would you convict us where we need to be convicted? Would you bring encouragement and peace where there needs to be encouragement? And I ask all of this, Lord, that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine that you had a very wealthy friend, and this very wealthy friend entrusted you with $10 million. $10 million, and the only, the only check, the only stipulation is that this friend would come back in 10 years and simply check on what you had done with the money. What would you do with the $10 million? Would you buy a bunch of stuff? You say, sweet, I can get a new house, I can buy a new car, get a boat. I've never had a boat. Maybe, oh, how great would a boat be? Maybe get a condo in Park City, ski tickets to all the most expensive ski resorts. Maybe you would invest the money. You would look at that $10 million and think, finally, I have the liquidity I need to, build a, to diversify a solid investment portfolio. Would you give it away? Would you give it away? Find all the charitable organizations and give it away. Find your family and friends who are in need and give away this money. This is an unlikely scenario, but remember, whatever you do with the money, your friend is going to come back in 10 years and check on you. So if you just blew all the money on whatever you wanted, your friend might not approve of that. In light of this, what would you do with the money? And what should we do with our money as Christians, knowing that we belong to God and all that we have 
also belongs to him? This is the question that Jesus answers for us today. Jesus answers the question what we ought to be doing with our money. So first, we're going to look at the parable and see what Jesus says about stewarding our money. And second, we will look at why we are not as wise as we should be with our money, why we don't follow what Jesus says we should in terms of stewardship. And lastly, we will see how Jesus shows us we can be wise with our money, overcoming the sinful condition that so often distracts us from proper stewardship. So that's where we're going. We should be wise, why we are not wise, and then lastly, how we can get there. Either our money will control us or we will control it for the glory of God. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our parable this morning and figure out what this parable means. As we were reading it, I'm sure at least some of you, if not all of you, at some point were kind of surprised by this parable. And as you can imagine, commentators and interpreters have wrestled across the centuries trying to figure out what is meant by this parable. It's one of the more difficult parables to understand that Jesus has for us. But we know that the word of God is understandable. So let's go ahead and jump in. uh, Here we have a wealthy man, and this wealthy man has entrusted his estate to a manager. Think of this manager as like a a first century example of an investment portfolio manager, right? So the wealthy man, he has too much going on. He has too many, his, his land is tied up in too many different aspects of a business. So therefore he hires another man on to help him manage these things. And now the time has come For this manager to come to account, he's going to give an accounting for how he has stewarded the money. And it turns out that the manager has done very poorly, as verse 2 tells us, or as, uh, yeah, verse 1 tells us, he was accused of wasting his possession. He was squandering the money and the wealth that was given to him. And so therefore, the manager is relieved of duty. And now he has to figure out what's next. What will he do? But he has not been relieved of duty yet. He has only been told that he will be relieved of duty, but he still has his position. And so he's trying to figure out what he's going to do next. Maybe some of you have been in this position before where you've been told that you're going to let go, but there's a period of time in which you're still working there. And so you have to figure out what are you going to do next? And this is exactly the point where the manager is. And so the manager thinks to himself, well, I'm not strong enough to dig, so any sort of construction work or manual labor is out of question. And I'm too ashamed to beg. Notice that there's still an element of pride here. (laughs) Even though he's lost his job, there's still an element of pride. He refuses that he will not beg. And he still, he realizes he still has power as manager. And as manager, he would have had legal right to make deals on behalf of his master. He would have essentially been, as he spoke, he is speaking for his master. And so therefore, he decides to make friends with the people of the town by wiping away their debts. It was a common practice that you, if you were lent in the, in the ancient world, that if you were lent a particular good, and, so, and as you were being charged interest on that, like today, we're charged interest on money that is lent to us, but if I loaned you, say, 500 loaves of bread... I might charge you a certain amount of interest, but that interest would be paid back in that uh, that particular good. And so that's what we see here. So these amounts that are owed to the master are likely both interest and principal. So 900 gallons of olive oil is what this one man owes. And the manager tells him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450, slashing what is owed in half. And he does the same with the man who owes a thousand bushels of wheat. He said, take your bill and make it 800, cutting it by 20%. He has legal right to do this on his master's behalf, even though he's not acting in his master's best interest. He's acting in his own self-interest. Imagine if you got a call from your uh, loan officer at your mortgage company. And he said, hey, I see that you owe $300,000 on your mortgage. I'm cutting it in half. We're just handing out deals today. That'd be pretty good news, wouldn't it? Or imagine if your property manager at your apartment complex said, hey, your landlord might not know about this. Doesn't matter. Your $2,000 per month rent, slash in half. And you're only paying 1000 bucks a month. This would be pretty good, right? You wish that this kind of fire sale actually existed. 
And what's curious is that the master commends the dishonest manager. Now, take that property manager example. Imagine if your property manager slashed your rate without the landlord knowing, and the landlord commended the property manager. What kind of a landlord would commend a property manager who loses out on all the profit that is due to him? Why does the master praise the steward? He's likely not praising the steward for the fact that he lost him a bunch of money. No landlord would likely praise a property manager for losing out on money. Instead, verse 8 tells us that he was praising him for his shrewdness. He's praising him for the fact that it was clever. Essentially, the master sees the the position that the manager is in. The, The master knows that the manager is going to lose his job, and he sees that the manager was acting in his own self-interest. And so it's kind of a a gesture of respect. It's one of those things where I'm not commending what you did is ethical, but I see that what you did was clever. Parents, I'm sure at some point you have seen this with your children. Maybe you see that they did something that wasn't right, but it sure was clever. And you think that in your head, even though you're not going to say anything because they need to be disciplined. I think that is the kind of commendation that the master is giving the steward. Now, the real question here is, why does Jesus tell the disciples this parable? If we look back at the parables that we've been in, with the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son in chapter 15, all of these parables were told in response to the Pharisees, who were sneering at Jesus because he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. But here in, in chapter 16, it says that Jesus told his disciples So therefore, the Pharisees aren't the main audience here, but it's actually the disciples who are the main audience. So why would the disciples need to hear this? Not only does the master commend the steward for his shrewdness, so also does Jesus. So is Jesus saying that we ought to be like the steward in every way? Let's say maybe you are a loan officer at your local mortgage company. Should you just go out and make friends for yourself by slashing everybody's debts? No, you shouldn't. You would probably be fired for that, for unethical behavior. It was within the manager's legal rights to do this, but it wasn't ethical. It wasn't necessarily moral. These days, we have proprietary laws that protect, against, uh, that protect uh, investors against this sort of behavior on the behalf of managers. It wasn't ethical behavior, but it was clever. It was strategic. And that, that is what Jesus is commending. Jesus is commending that the steward thought, in light of the end, he thought about how best can he use his current position to, and he therefore strategized in light of the end. He knew that he would lose his job, and so therefore he used his job to ensure that he wouldn't end up on the street. Imagine if the steward had done nothing. If the steward had done nothing, then he would have been much worse off. And so it was, he was acting out of self-interest at the expense of his master, but he did protect himself for the future. So how does this show us what Jesus wants us to do with our money? Well, he tells us in verse 9, verse 9 reads, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. In other words, the steward didn't care about the money in and of itself. Rather, he used the money for different ends. He didn't have any money when uh, when he left his job, but he did have the friends that he had made by using his power. And so we also ought to use our money like this. Jesus isn't saying make friends for yourself by worldly wealth by just going out and buying a bunch of friends. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that just like the manager used his wealth to make friends for himself, so also we ought to use our money in light of the end, in light of the fact that we will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We ought to be strategic about the money that God has given us, but often we aren't. Often we kind of just go day to day, maybe paycheck to paycheck, just kind of figuring things out and maybe not strategizing as we ought to do. If we cannot be trusted even with little things, Jesus says, how can we be trusted with great and weighty things? In order to answer this question, we have to dig deeper. We've talked about how Jesus want, what Jesus wants for us in regards to money, but in order to figure out how to do that, we need to look at why 
We don't often do what Jesus wants us to with our money. And this brings us to our second point, why we don't follow Jesus with what he wants us to do with our money. And Jesus shows us in this passage two different kinds of people. There are the kind who are absent-minded, who are not wise to the world, and then there are those who are self-righteous about money, and we'll get to that when we get to the Pharisees. First, Jesus confronts those who are absent-minded about the money, their money in this parable. Instead of being wise to the world uh, in ways of using their money, instead, the sons of light, that is Christians, often are not wise and are often walking in darkness in terms of the, ways, the wise ways to use money. And Jesus is telling us two principles here. We need to be active with our money and finances, whether we've been given very little or given very much. We need to be active with our money and finances and stewarding them. And the second principle that Jesus is telling us is that we ought to be, there's nothing wrong with worldly resources. Strategy and doing research is not impious. Sometimes as Christians, we have this attitude of, oh, you know what? God will take care of it. There's no need to lay out a plan for how we're going to use this or how we're going to raise a certain amount of money to do with what we want to do. We'll just pray over it and let God take care of it. And sometimes God does deliver. Sometimes God does deliver in those circumstances. And in all things, we absolutely should be praying. But there's nothing wrong with strategizing and doing research, especially in major financial decisions. After all, take this building that we're worshiping in as an example. In order to build this building, people would have had to have given their hard-earned money towards a building fund in order to get this building built. Now imagine this money has been entrusted to the deacons and to the elders who are overseeing the process. And imagine with this money, the elders and deacons did not go out and search for the best price. They contacted one contractor, and they were like, oh, well, he seems to be a good guy. Let's just use him. And they didn't do any research as far as getting the best price and getting the best contractor. Would that be a wise stewardship of the resources that have been given to the elders and deacons to build a building? No, it wouldn't. It would be disobedient to God because they would not be stewarding those resources in a wise way. They would not be wise to the world in, way, in the ways in which the world uses money, as Jesus says. And it's the same idea in regard to personal finances. God has given you every dollar you have, and he has called you to steward that rightly. So say, next time you go make a car purchase, okay, go, it, it, there's nothing wrong with doing research and, do, and doing your best to get the best deal that you have, okay? Even negotiating, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, right? We shouldn't do this out of pride. We shouldn't just be uh, seeking to negotiate so that we can brag to our friends about how we argued the guy down another $300. But we should be thinking, how can I use my resources best to glorify God? I need a new car. Right? Sometimes we are at a point in our lives where we simply just need one. Right? And how do we do that best to glorify God and steward our money rightly? But as I said earlier, oftentimes we don't do this. We don't think this way because we have a wrong mindset. And sometimes we think that less knowledge is more pious, but that's not what Jesus is saying. So that's the absent-minded way of viewing money. And then Jesus confronts a, on a deeper level, a self-righteousness in the Pharisees, a self-righteousness about money. Jesus tells us in verse 13 that we cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve God and money. In verse 14, then, the Pharisees sneer at Jesus, and he tells them their, but then Jesus responds by telling them their heart issue in verse 15. Jesus says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Here the Pharisees are described as lovers of money. Lovers of money. Now we get many descriptions of the Pharisees in the Gospels. right? We know that the Pharisees are scrupulous in their obedience to the law. We know that the Pharisees are self-righteous. And here they are called lovers of money. Now, this might seem strange to us. I think sometimes when, we're, when we hear about the obedience and the practices of the Pharisees, sometimes we, we can think of them as like Franciscan mon monks who have taken a vow of poverty so that they can serve God better. But we see here that that is clearly not their hearts. And we see in other passages that the reason why the Pharisees often obey the law of God is not because they love God, but because they love the opinions of other people. 
And Jesus tells them on multiple occasions, truly you have received your reward if this is what you are after. If you are only after the praise and the admiration of others, you will receive your reward. But in the end, what kind of a reward is that if all we receive is the praise and admiration of others at the expense of God's praise and admiration? The Pharisees claim to follow God, but really they love money and to be justified in the eyes of other people. Now, we might look at this and say, oh, those Pharisees, how, you know, how, what kind of a person could possibly want to be justified in the eyes of other people? Well, if you think that, think back to when you were a kid. Think back to when you were a child and somebody had something and that made them cool, whether it was a new backpack, a lunchbox, a toy, a gadget, whatever. Maybe they, their parents were well off and they had a very cool house. And all the kids wanted to know them. They were popular because of that. And all of a sudden you thought, well, there's one way to get admiration in, in the eyes of others. I want to be cool just like them. And you begin chasing after those things. You see, this human condition that is exhibited in the Pharisees is also in us. And this it continues to play out as we get older, right? We get a little bit older, we get into middle school and high school, and it becomes about the clothes that we're wearing. It becomes about the kind of car that we're driving. If you go off to college or if you go off to technical school or whatever that looks like, pretty soon it becomes about the job that you're working, the kind of house that you can afford, the kind of vacations that you go on. And sometimes things are just popular because the masses say so, but we so want to be considered right and in, in to be admired by other people that we do these things, even if we don't necessarily even like them. And if we allow this to fester, it can turn into greed, and, and we can, if, allowing this to fester, we can just want money for the sake of itself, just so that, other pe so that we can have more than other people. This is what love of money can turn into if we allow it to fester. Now, not only this, but self-righteous love, self love of money can appear this way, appearing like having a bunch of possessions so that we are admired in the eyes of other, but it can, others, but it can also appear in the form of saving. Maybe, to go back to the kid example, maybe you were the type of kid that, while well, all the other kids want this cool gadget, toy, or whatever, or backpack, you think, that's just impractical. Do you know how much that costs? No way. No, no, no. I'd rather save my money and use it on something else. Maybe when you, got, you and your siblings got Christmas money and your siblings were like, oh yeah, I want to go buy this. You were like, you know what? I'm just going to save it. I don't even know what I'm saving it for. I just like saving it. I just like the feeling of having money. Maybe that's you. And then you get older and you realize that having money feels like a way to protect against risk in the future. You find as you get older, there's this thing called insurance that protects and hedges against different things that can happen in your future. In this way, money becomes a deliverance from anxiety. It doesn't look like the flashy car or the new house or whatever, but it is an example of the same sin because money has become your deliverance and not Christ. And you cannot serve both God and money. So which of these camps do you find yourself in? Do you find yourself to be the spender, just accumulating a bunch of stuff so that other people admire you? Or are you more the saver, trying to protect yourself against an uncertain future and using money to provide comfort and peace and security? Likely, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we likely fall into a bit of both. Right? There's certain aspects of our lives where we like to seek the admiration of others, and then there's other aspects where we're trying to use money to calm our anxieties. And the reason why I show this is, be, is to show that we all have, at, at, at root, we all have, and to some level, an issue with how we view money, just like the Pharisees did. And this, okay, the whole point of this is this is why we don't steward our money wisely. Jesus has shown us how we ought to steward our money. We ought to steward our money in light of the end, in light of the eternal dwellings, in light of heaven that is promised to us. And the reason why we don't is a heart issue. It's not anything wrong with money itself. After all, money is really just a representation of time and resources. And we can use it for good ends or we can use it for selfish ends. And when we use it for selfish ends, whether we try to justify ourselves in the eyes of others or whether we're trying to save money so that we can feel comfortable and secure, we are using money for our own good and not the glory of God. 
So we've talked about what Jesus wants. That was our first point. We've talked what, about what Jesus wants for us with our money. And then we've just finished up talking about why we don't do that, why we don't follow what Jesus wants for our money. Now, what, and now you might be asking, what's the way out? Okay, I know that I am not the way, I don't steward the way I ought to. I see the ways in which I, I'm disobeying God. So what's the way out? How can I serve God the way I ought to? And Jesus reminds us of this way in verse 9. We go back to verse 9. Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Again, Jesus' reference to making friends is not necessarily a literal reference. He's not saying go out and buy friends for yourself. I think he's referring to how the manager used this money to uh, to, in light of the end, strategizing and thinking about where he is going to end up. Jesus is commending the dishonest manager because he thought and used his money in light of the end. And so therefore, we ought to use our money in light of the end. We have the promise of the new heavens and new earth. As we sang this morning, we are bound for the promised land. And this frees us for, from wanting to justify ourselves in front of others. After all, if we are bound to the promised land, brothers and sisters, who cares what other people really think of us? As the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are trouble and sorrow, and they quickly pass. What is the point of trying to justify yourself for 70 or 80 years or however long your life is if you know that eternity, eternal joy is before you in Christ? This is the promise of the Christian. Christ has conquered these desires, these desires to please other people, these desires to provide security and comfort for ourselves. He's conquered those desires in our heart. They were nailed to the cross, and we are free. Jesus has taken away that which was detestable in us in God's eyes, and he has given us a new vision to strive for, a vision that he has purchased for us by his blood. The tendency oftentimes when we're seeking after comfort, can be to view God as stingy, right? God has blessed us in a certain level, but we think, oh, well, I better, I better save this because I don't know if God's going to bless me again. So we hold on to what we have in case it might run out. We're constantly worried about that. But when we reflect on the new heavens and the new earth, we see God as abundant. God is an abundant God who promises eternal blessing and eternal joy with him in heaven. Therefore, we can be free to give money away and steward it rightly because it is ultimately God's. What if we strategize giving money to the church the way we strategize retirement or getting the next vacation or new car? What if we strategize to give more to our local churches and to give to other people who are in need in ministries and just those who are in need in our communities around us, just to see what God might do with it. What if this was our desire with our money? This ought to be our orientation as Christians. What would God have us do with this? Another question that the Christian ought to be asking regularly is, is there anything that we can do better to orient our finances so that we may glorify God? Now, these are broad, general questions, and each one of you have specifics that... Ultimately, I can't answer, and this text can't answer specifically, but in prayer and in wisdom, we may be shown by God what we are ought to do with our money. These are general principles that we ought to follow with our finances, and ultimately, we ought to orient everything we do, including our finances, to glorify God. Is how we manage our money reflective of the fact that we will spend eternity with God? If you find yourself struggling with this, if you find yourself struggling with this concept, or you realize that, man, I really haven't honored God at all with my finances. I've, I've really thought that money is mine and it's about me. Know that there is good news. Christ has purchased you. There's grace for tomorrow and for the next time that you see your bank statement, the next time you go set the monthly budget, whatever that looks like. Know that how you steward your finances is not a matter of earning privileges before God. But it's a matter of worship. It's a matter of honoring him in light of what he has done for us. You are not justified on account of your finances. You are justified by Christ and what he has done for you. 
Therefore, in light of what Christ has done for you, we can orient all of our lives, including our finances, to glorify Him. This is what Jesus wants for us. We see how Jesus is the solution to our problem. We have a problem with money, but the issue isn't the money. Ultimately, it's us. We want to please other people. We want to have other people be impressed by us. Or we want to protect ourselves against an uncertain future and to get comfort and security that comes from having a lot of money. And we do these things instead of thinking about how God would have us use this money and how we will give an account to God about how we have stewarded the money that he has given us. The good news is that Jesus has borne our sinfulness on our behalf and he has freed us from these sinful tendencies. He has freed us from our sinful nature and he allows us to serve God. If you, th- if you think back to the illustration at the beginning, just like the friend at the beginning who gave you the money to do with what you please, you have been given money by God to steward And how you do this reflects your heart. But be of good cheer, Christian, because for you, this is a matter of worship. This is not a matter of judgment. So the next time you save up for something or begin to set the monthly budget, think about how you can worship the Lord with what he has given you. And know that at the end, you will be received into eternal dwellings and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Lord, I know that this can be a difficult uh, discussion, Lord, in thinking about money, and I just pray, Lord, for those in here who, who are struggling with finances. Lord, I pray that you would provide a way for them to, uh, to be provided for, for food and shelter and clothing, Lord. For those of you who have been, bl- or for those who have been blessed by you here, I pray that Uh, Lord, we would all be thinking about how we can best steward our finances, whether we have been given much or little. I pray that we would orient everything, Lord, to glorify you. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.